I was only eight years old when I first played Final Fantasy IV on the Super Nintendo. I'm sure I'm not alone in it being one of my favorites of the series, as it completely changed the expectations of RPGs. There was a legendary music composed by Nobuo Uematsu and a leap in visual style going into 16-bit graphics. But what kept me coming back to replay this game and its many iterations so many times over the years was the story. It's the first role-playing game I remember playing with actual character development and arcs, as well as using the mechanics of the game to further the story. Like, all black magic users can cast fire, except the one who had their town burned down, making them too scared to do so. This game really defined a lot of what would become staples of the Final Fantasy series. You play as Cecil Harvey, the Dark Knight of the Kingdom Baron. We immediately learn that Cecil has just committed an atrocity, and then during the first 30 minutes of the game, as we see him wrestle with this guild, we unknowingly help commit another atrocity. Wanting to redeem himself, Cecil rebels against Baron. A couple of years ago, I was replaying Final Fantasy IV again, but this time with a 3D version of the game that's on Steam, and I found myself appreciating the story on a whole new level. Part of that was due to a better translation, as the original on the SNES is known for being quite bad, a bigger part is the story had become more relatable as I had gotten much older. It feels more common to see coming of age stories where the hero is trying to figure out who they are, but Cecil is an older character, putting the focus on reflecting on who he has become and what he's been made into, then deciding who he wants to be instead. One of the pivotal moments being when Cecil becomes a paladin and has to fight a Dark Knight reflection himself. And it's this moment that really stuck with me in this playthrough because I found out I had always done this battle wrong. So please join me in revisiting this classic and seeing how me completely missing a major point of the game actually made the story better this time around. Before we get to Cecil's journey to become a paladin, please consider subscribing and hitting the bell for more content. All right, let's jump in. We start on the Red Wings, a military airship fleet of Baron commanded by Cecil. Immediately, soldiers are questioning the military they serve because they were just forced to slaughter innocent people of Mysidia to take the Wind Crystal. While some things did not come across in the original US translation, this part still did. The game flat out says the Kingdom Baron has to loot to prosper and that the King has decided the people of Mysidia were just too dangerous. This opening is the first time a game ever made me think of real world events. It may have even been the first time any media had done so at that age for me. I had only just learned the basics of World War II, and I knew the game was made in Japan, though even eight-year-old me remembered wondering if the game was influenced by these events. I didn't understand things like imperialism at the time, but there was a clash in emotions as part of me was excited at what else could happen if a game was going to start like this, but also a discomfort seeing Cecil justify an atrocity to the troops. On returning to Baron, Cecil asks the king why they attacked Mysidia, which immediately gets him reprimanded and removed from the command of the Red Wings. During this, we meet Kane, a lifelong friend of Cecil who is ordered to join us on our new mission after barging in to defend us. Now, younger me, I think, was just focused on what the hell is a Dragoon? Because it sounds cool as hell, and I was ready to go fight some monsters. But spending time exploring the castle and the town nearby, we learn a lot. Not only were the Red Wings sent to steal from Mysidia, but their people had been imprisoned in Baron. And we learn of the magical Serpent Road, which gave passage between Mysidia and Baron. This seemed like a big deal to me because it implies there was a close connection between those two kingdoms. When we eventually get to Mysidia later in the game, we learn that they don't have any transportation like that with any other kingdoms, only Baron. Making that beginning attack by the Red Wings much more nefarious, as it was also an act of betrayal. When we think of role-playing games, we think of story and choices. Final Fantasy games are bigger on the story with very little choice, and Final Fantasy IV has less choice than most of the series. You don't ever decide who is in your party, what job your characters are, or even what skills will be learned. All of that is decided by your level or your progress in the story. Really, the only choice you are given is whether or not to rename your characters, and even that was removed from the later 3D versions. Speaking of which, did anyone else ever name characters after people you knew? I used to guess who a character reminded me of and name them accordingly. I haven't done that in the longest time, but I feel like I remember adding another emotional level to the game. Like, the character's background would be mixed with the person I knew in my head. 
I always remember doing this with Final Fantasy IV especially because it's such a roller coaster of a narrative. You never know who's going to die, or betray you, or turn out to not really be dead. So every time something happened, it would add some extra weight imagining it was someone I actually knew. This is something I really love about games. Even small amounts of interactivity, as simple as changing a name, can have a huge impact in how we experience them. The adventure really begins for us as players as we are given control of Thessal and Cain as they set out to complete their orders to slay a phantom creature and make a delivery to the town of Mist. As we make our way through a cave towards Mist, we begin to hear warnings to turn back, implying this isn't just some creature, but something intelligent, seemingly defensive in nature, wanting to protect Mist. And we know there is good reason to fear soldiers from Baron. As we approach the exit of the cave, we are given a final choice. And while, as the player, it's not a real choice if we want to continue playing, I think this prompt is really important. It emphasizes that Cecil and Kane are choosing to fight. This first boss fight is such a great example of game design combined with storytelling. There's this epic boss music hype us up and we get our first battle to really highlight the active time battle system, which was new to this game. While all the battles before now use this system as well, the Mist Dragon shows us how the addition of time makes some fights into puzzles. Battles are where we get the most choice in the game, and the active time battle system added another layer by introducing time. So instead of just picking the command we want to perform, when we perform it mattered. This game design choice allowed for more complexity rather than I'm going to win every battle through brute force. For example, if you attack when this boss turns into mist, not only will you do no damage, but you will get punished with a counterattack that damages your whole party. And this works well with the main theme of the game, which according to Takashi Tokita, who was the scenario writer of the original release and the executive producer and director of Final Fantasy IV's 3D version for the DS, is brute strength alone is in power. And this theme is really important in relation to Cecil, but more on that later. So after the rush of defeating our first boss, we arrive at the village Mist, only to discover we've been sent to commit a genocide, eliminating everyone who can summon Edelons like the Mist Dragon. Not only have we unknowingly destroyed this whole town, we discover that the dragon we killed was linked to this little girl's mother, meaning our first big victory resulted in killing her mom. Without this, we as the player may feel less responsible or attached to the events that have happened so far. We learned Cecil killed innocents for the water crystal, but we didn't do it. And we didn't know we were carrying a bomb. But the Mist Dragon? We had to actively choose to fight. It takes our first big victory and twists it into something terrible we've done. And just in case it's not clear we are the bad guys yet, Kane even suggests we kill the little girl. After all, the logical conclusion of our orders is the king has decided that summoners are a threat. Unwilling to take one more innocent life, Cecil is done taking orders. Kane agrees to join him, and they urge the girl to come with them to safety. Understandably, she does not want to go along with people who just killed her mother and everyone else she knew. We are the bad guys, and the first act of bravery we witness in this game is a child fighting back against us. This battle was really uncomfortable, especially the first time around for me. I didn't know some battles were unwinnable, so I attacked. I want to say I figured maybe mechanically it would be played as knocking her unconscious to get her to safety or something. But I was eight, and mechanically this was all new territory for an RPG. So I just did what I thought we were supposed to do. We were introduced to time mattering in battle, so you can just wait and let the battle play out. But the first time around, that hadn't quite sunk in for me yet. This may not seem like a big deal, as very quickly, she summons Titan and mops the floor with us. But the game didn't have to give us the option here to choose any commands. The whole fight could have played like a cutscene. After all, fight cutscenes are used throughout the game. In fact, the first two battles and the SNES version were cutscenes when Cecil battled monsters on the airship at the start of the game. In those battles, we did not get the option to pick any commands. So it seemed safe to assume this was an intentional game design choice. If you played the original game, I wonder if you were like me and tried to attack her your first time playing. Or did you hesitate, or maybe realize there were other options? And can I just say, this was an incredible introduction to summoning. This little girl summons Titan, who is so strong, they cause an earthquake that literally destroys the terrain, making mist no longer accessible by normal routes. It also showcases the mechanics being used to support the narrative again. As when the girl, who's named Rydia, joins our party, we might excitedly check what her summon magic is and find all she can manage is call a chocobo one time. I remember thinking, that's it? 
Where's Titan? Seeing her hit points and other stats only further shows how brave Rydia was to stand up to us and speaks to the strength she summoned in a moment of need, something she could only do out of pure desperation. These types of small details really helped elevate Final Fantasy IV. Another great example is when Tella, a master sage, gains access to the most powerful spell, Meteor. But the spell costs more mana points than he ever has access to. So, while we have access to spells more powerful than any other mage early on with Tella, we can always see the option for Meteor, but never actually select it. So when Tella finally casts Meteor, it's a huge moment and makes us really believe that it would kill him doing so, because we knew it was beyond his limits. And of course, the game design choice that hit me the most was perhaps worse than even the famous death in Final Fantasy VII for me. Hallam and Porum are two kid mages from Mysidia who petrify themselves to stop a wall trap from crushing the party. And then Tella, with the strongest magic at his fingertips, is unable to heal them. Every time I play through this, I remember how I felt that first time. I desperately wanted to help them. What really made it so powerful was you could interact with Palum and Porum Petrified. See, whenever you interacted with something that needed an item in this game, the menu would pop up. In many cases, there was a specific key item you needed, but none of the obvious choices that you might use in battle to heal petrification would do anything here as if to say there was something different about them willingly making the sacrifice than an enemy turning you into stone. This happens somewhat early in the game, and every time I got a new item, I would journey all the way back to the castle to see if maybe this would heal them, only to be disappointed each trip and sad all over again because nothing actually works. So whoever made the design choice to have this menu pop up, well done, because without that, it would have been a sad moment but never become one of my most memorable moments in gaming, especially since Palum and Porum do actually end up just being okay later. Brute strength alone isn't power can be a difficult theme to pull off well, especially since RPGs rely on mechanics where you level up, get stronger weapons and better magic, all of which lead to more powerful characters. Many RPGs have a sense of camaraderie and banding together against a greater power. But as the heroes get more powerful, it can feel like you just need to have the right people with power. Just a simple good versus evil. Final Fantasy IV attempts to do something different with Cecil becoming a paladin. How well the game pulls it off is debatable perhaps, since I did actually completely miss this theme for nearly 30 years. See, my takeaway previously was Cecil had to stop being a Dark Knight and become a paladin just because we needed the good power versus the evil power. Basically, you can't use evil to defeat evil. And to be clear, I like that theme, and I think it is one of the game's themes. But realizing what was intended in this battle, where Cecil must face himself, added a lot more meaning to the entire story for me. And all it took was a small game design change, which allowed me to appreciate it. Before Cecil must battle his past, and the harm he has done as a Dark Knight, he first is forced to face the people he has harmed. Having been shipwrecked at sea, Cecil washes ashore all alone. The only time Cecil has been alone before now, was when he first decided to disobey Baron and attack the soldiers to protect Rydia. It didn't really feel heroic after everything Cecil had done up to that point, but it was the start of Cecil's change. So Cecil wakes up, and the only place nearby to ask for help is Mysidia, where he had led the Red Wings to attack and take their crystal. They are not happy to see us. While I think this setup is perfect for Cecil's redemption, his redemption overall does admittedly resolve too easily given everything Cecil had done to Mysidia. Part of that may be due to a quarter of the original script being cut due to hardware limitations during its initial release. Most likely, this is also why the pace of the game seems so fast and how quickly major events happen. And in fairness, we are sent to climb the top of a place called Mount Ordeals. As the subtle name implies, the elder of Mysidia did not really think we would make it back. The climb is difficult as there are many undead along the way, which zombies are basically immune to Cecil's dark sword. Even the boss uses zombies against us. Finally, Cecil is able to become a paladin, but not until he vanquishes the Dark Knight version of himself. This is where I assumed we had gotten the right kind of power, and now we were good. We could vanquish evil. I mean, I did just beat up Dark Knight version of me and become a paladin, only we aren't supposed to defeat the Dark Knight. We aren't supposed to attack at all. I want to re-emphasize, I play this game a lot, and it even tells you to sheathe your sword when you attack. 
Yet, I didn't realize I did this wrong until I played the 3D remake of the game that had changed the fight so it would just continue until you finally stopped attacking. I'm not ashamed to admit, even then, I actually found out the solution by accident. I had incorrectly assumed from the previous versions of the game this was a scripted battle. You just had to make sure your Cecil didn't die over the allotted time. The battle was easy enough, I never needed to heal myself more than a couple of cure spells, which conveniently, Cecil had just gained access to. It all made sense, besides the weird line telling me to sheathe my sword, which I just attributed to a bad translation. The 3D version is generally more difficult, so I had long run out of mana to cast cure and had even been using potions. I mean, you never use potions. Starting to get frustrated by how long the battle was taking, I pulled out my phone to look up what to do. As I was searching, I realized somehow I had won all of a sudden by doing nothing. I was so shocked, I reloaded my last save to do the battle again. There was no way a scripted battle would go for several minutes, so I had to confirm it was me doing nothing that had finished the battle. And sure enough, I got into the fight and after a couple of attacks, it just ended. I immediately started searching if this worked in the Super Nintendo version and confirmed it did. I honestly am not sure I can properly convey just how shocking this was for me. I had completely missed something fundamental to one of my favorite games that I had replayed countless times over almost 30 years. I also found it wasn't just me. There were forum posts asking what to do because they were stuck. There's even a TV trope listed for Final Fantasy IV aptly called comically missing the point for this battle. In missing the point of this battle, my actions were like a perfect metaphor for what the game was trying to say. My assumptions and ideas of what were possible options within the game system led me to attack. Even though there were battles like the Mist Dragon that tried to teach me attacking was not always the right thing to do, I would always attack without consequences that forced me to stop. Like seeing my attacks did no damage or getting hit with a counterattack. I was obeying what I thought the rules of the game were, even if the game explicitly told me to stop. I was following an ideology of what I'm supposed to do in an RPG, so I didn't see an option that lied outside of that ideology. I've worn this darkened armor for so long now, there's no mode of light left in me. It seemed fitting I played this version of Final Fantasy IV at that time in my life. I was at a huge turning point and had begun to completely reshape my worldview. I too was trying to redeem myself from harm I had done and even started to question traditional so-called wisdom that I now saw as harmful. Like I had changed my approach to parenting so our kids were given more agency and treated with respect rather than relying on things like punishment. I had also started to re-examine history, politics, and much more. It felt like a parallel to this revelation I had with Cecil which got me thinking about the rest of the game and its symbolism, particularly around Dark Knights. Like, let's look at what changes for Cecil. Cecil becomes a level one paladin and loses access to the type of armor and weapons he used as a Dark Knight. As a Dark Knight, Cecil started the game at level 10 and did lots of damage. The last Dark Sword you receive is called Deathbringer and even had a chance to just instantly kill enemies. He also loses his powerful darkness ability, which allowed him to do more damage by hurting himself. Even though Cecil wanted to protect people, his Dark Knight job was only about violence. While as a paladin, Cecil can still fight, he gained access to white magic, which allows him to heal, and the cover ability, which allowed him to protect someone else from damage by throwing himself in front of the attack. Cecil's change to a paladin represents a completely different way of thinking, a change in ideology. We not only can issue the command cover to protect an ally, he does so automatically. If an ally is low on life, he cannot help himself with a jump in front to take the attack to save them, even if Cecil is near the brink of death himself. As Cecil overcomes his Dark Knight clone, we see the following words. Some fight for law, some fight for justice. Which will you fight for? As a paladin, Cecil fights for justice, doing what's right even if it means disobeying the most powerful kingdom in the world. As a Dark Knight, Cecil fought for law, where he was supposed to follow orders to uphold whoever was in power to give them. Sure seems like a parallel to other institutions that claim to protect, but actually afflict lots of harm, especially skewed towards those who have less money or power. Like, look at how the villagers respond to Cecil in the town of Baron. It's not respect or gratitude for being protected, it's fear, worried about being punished for breaking the law. And remember how Dark Knight swords can't hurt zombies? While the meaning of zombies has greatly changed in popular culture in the last few decades, especially after the release of Dawn of the Dead in 1978, zombies first appeared in mythology during the 17th and 18th centuries in Haiti. 
When France ruled the area, zombies were a projection of the inhumanity that existed for many enslaved. A deep fear that even in death, there would be someone to command their flesh to continue working. They were afraid of someone like Garmiglion, the boss we had to face atop Mount Ordeal. He was sent to fight Cecil because he commanded undead. Now, I'm not going to assume this was intentional by the developers, but it feels like an awful coincidence. Even though the game says Dark Knights are useless against undead, only the zombie type undead Dark Knights can't hurt. Because those fighting on the side of justice, like a paladin, would be able to release zombies freeing them. While those fighting for law have historically been used to keep people enslaved. If you're interested in that history, I'd highly recommend The End of Policing by Alex S. Vitale and Our Enemies in Blue by Christian Williams. Cecil talked about wanting to protect when he fought for the law, but ultimately, to do so, he had to quit his job and get a new one. I've been wanting to deep dive through the Final Fantasy games again, so please let me know if there is any of the series you'd like me to cover in the comments. I'm sure I'll even end up playing Final Fantasy IV again whenever the Pixel Remaster comes out. And I definitely want to check out the others as well. Some of them I have never played before, but many will be nice to revisit. I love revisiting media I enjoyed in the past, and not just because of nostalgia, but because we will likely see more subtext and nuance to the things we loved growing up. Sometimes this can be disappointing. There might be messages or things that have aged poorly, sometimes so poorly it becomes hard to still enjoy. But usually when I revisit things, I find I appreciate the art more. That there are values and themes that resonated in the past with me for a reason, and now I'm just able to more fully appreciate. Either way, I think revisiting art that really connected with us in the past is enlightening. It's an opportunity to observe how we have changed through our experiences and how we have grown. And games add an interesting layer to this due to the interactivity and mechanics involved. Playing between different versions of Final Fantasy IV show that seemingly small changes to gameplay can have a big impact in how we experience the story and what we take away from it. Final Fantasy IV certainly has some moments that have not aged well, but overall, it's a fun game that has a lot of interesting things to say. Thank you all for watching, and a huge thanks to our patrons for your support. I want to recommend Zanzi and his recent video on Final Fantasy VII in Ideology, which does a much deeper dive into ideology. I'm a patron of his, and I know he spent over a year working on this, so I hope he gets more views on it. It also helped inspire me to polish this idea and finish it off as well. I first thought of this over a year ago. Before you go, please consider leaving a like if you enjoyed this, a dislike if you didn't, and subscribe and hit the bell if you'd like to see more like this. It really helps the channel. And of course, if you really like what we do and can afford it, please consider supporting us on Patreon. You get access to videos early, like this one, as well as getting to help decide things for the channel and some behind the scenes stuff. Take care, everyone. And remember, you're not alone.